OK, so uh, last time we, uh, as I said, we are, the course is moving between the syntax and the semantics. And so far, we've already talked about, only talked about the syntax of propositional logic because we just defined what the words of the new language are going to be. So now we have a satisfactory definition. We know exactly what the words are. We have an algorithm that can tell us if a given a sequence of symbols is a legal word or not. So we can move on. So we, here we just had the definition so here we had a definition of the language. And now we have an algorithm that uh, allows us to check what belongs to the language or not not. And now we want to turn into the, the semantics. And we'll keep going between them. That's not the end of the story here. So today we are going to focus uh, or start talking about the semantics. So what is the semantic of propositional uh, uh, logic? The semantics is very simple. The semantics is based on, we have two. So uh, the semantics is based on two. Uh, true, what we call truth values. Uh, true and false. And when we want to talk about the truth or falsity of a statement, so we assume, as I said in the introductory lecture, logic is not about telling us what's true and what's false. Logic is about telling us how to reach from assumptions to conclusions. So we assume that someone tells us. So we assume uh, we start with a given what we call the truth assignment. To a propositional variables. So what is a truth assignment? So we start with the truth assignment. We have the notion of truth values. What is a truth assignment? A truth assignment is a function that goes, let's call it v. It's a function that goes from some set s to true false where s is a set of propositional variables. So we, someone is telling us, say, for example, s tells us that here is a way to describe s. So I have some uh, variables, uh, p1, p2, p7. And the assignment S tells me uh, S tells me that P1 should be true and P2 should be false and P7 should be false. That's a true assignment. Yes. So would that not be then a mapping from S to multiple true falses, not to a single? That notation up there was sort of odd. <laughs> you were like, yeah, but it maps from that notation up there does not mean it from a set to a single true false. The well, the, no, the notation, we, we always have a notation. I have a function from a set A to a set B. Oh, yeah. It means that for every element of A, it assigns an element of B. Okay. So it's the same here. For every element, for every propositional variable, it assigns a value. OK, so S is uh, this V. It, sorry, this V is just a function. I can, let's write it here. It's a function that assigns a truth a value to every propositional variables in our set S. Now to 
What is the semantics of the propositional uh, logic? The semantics is actually an extension. So we define how to extend such an assignment to assign values, truth values, to every propositional formula over S. So we want to extend this definition of that we are given. Someone is telling us whether uh, P1, P2, P7 are true or false. Now we want to extend it. We want to assign it to a function V hat. I'll, I'll designate it by V hat. And now V hat is a function that goes from all propositional formulas. So the set of all uh, propositional formulas over S that use the variable S to true or false. So how shall we define this extension? It's very natural. So for example, if V of uh, P1 is T, V, we want V hat of the negation of P1 to be false. Or we want to define V hat of any propositional formula. So I, I have here any alpha. I want to define what is going to be V hat of alpha. That's what we want to define. And we do it by uh, what we call the truth tables. So we have, we define the extension by a four fixed truth tables one for every connective. So the truth table for the negation will be that. So here I will have a alpha, and here I will have the negation of alpha. And it tells me that if alpha is, gets the value true, the negation of alpha should get false. And if alpha gets false, the negation of alpha should be true. And similarly, the truth table for a wedge. So again, it, it involves two variables, alpha, two formulas, alpha and beta. And here I, I have to tell you what will be the truth value of alpha wedge beta. And it tells you that if this is <coughs> true, and this is true, this is true, and this is false, we go over all possibilities, false, false. And we go over all possibilities, and it tells us what should be the truth value for uh, this formula. This is going to be true, false, false, false. And similarly, the truth table for, if I don't want to rewrite everything, I can edit here the truth table for alpha v beta, and the truth table for alpha arrow beta. So this again, for alpha v beta, it's going to be true, 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 and false. And here it's going to be true, false, true, true. So this is kind of a fixed, this arbitrary, somewhat arbitrary uh, decision. This is the way we are going to interpret our connectives. So before we continue, just one word about what does it mean that we chose this interpretation of the connectives. So as we can easily see, the, it means that the uh, right angle is interpreted as the negation. It means that the V, the wedge, is interpreted as N. So this is true if and only if both of them are true. So alpha and beta is true if and only if both alpha and beta are true. 
Similarly, we can see from this table that this uh, interpretation of V is O, because this is true if and only if one of them is true. So is it the exclusive O or the inclusive O? Which O is it? Is it the O that says A, O, B, but not both? Or it's the O that says A, O, B, or both of them? Yes. It's inclusive. It's, it, yeah, it's A or B or both of them. In all cases, it'll be true. The only one that really needs more attention, which is kind of not very intuitive, is the one for the implication. So the problem is that when we talk about implication in English, when we say alpha implies beta, we usually have in some kind of causal relationship in mind. Whereas here, the, the way to read it is that alpha arrows beta is true. It is kind of a, a promise. I make you a promise that will, uh, if alpha will be true, then I will make beta true. So if alpha is false, whenever alpha is false, I didn't violate my promise. So whenever alpha is false, alpha arrows beta is marked as true. We didn't violate the promise. So this is very, we have to, kind of be uh, cautious about it, this is different than the English notion of implies. It's not implies, I, I'll call it error, and it means that if it's a promise, if alpha is true, then beta is true. If alpha is false, then this is going to be true. So if, if I want, say, P to stand for Uh, if I want P to stand for today is uh, Monday and Q to stand for, for the moon is made of cheese, then under this interpretation, what will be the value of P arrow Q? We, under this interpretation, we know, is this true or not? Is today Monday or not? No. It's false. Is the moon made of cheese or not? No. So both, of the, but what about the implication? The implication, according to the table, will be true. So this is, we have to be careful. It's different than the English interpretation. In the propositional logic, if today is Monday, then the moon is made of cheese, and this is true six days of the week. <laughs> On Monday, it's going to be false. So we have to be aware that there is some kind of discrepancy here. But it's very easy to see that this is the best we could do. The, the, la the language that we have is very limited. And what is limited about this language is this language takes statements. It takes statements, P, Q, whatever. And it cannot look into the statement. The only thing you care about the statement is whether the statement is true or false. So if you only care about whether the statement is true or false, and you want to talk about implication, this is probably the best table that you can get. Every other choice here will be worse. Because when we talk about implication in English, we care about not only the truth or falsity of statements. I could have two statements that said both of them are true in English, but in English one of them implies the other and the other is not, right? I, I say that take today is Thursday and uh, the Earth is uh, moving around the sun, is, is cycling around the sun. Both of them are true, but we will not say in English that if today is Thursday, then the Earth is circling the sun. Because what we care about in English is not just whether it's true or false. We care about more co about the content of those statements. The propositional logic is very limited. The propositional logic, all it can do, you give it some statement, it just picks, checks whether it's true or false. What can you conclude from just knowing whether it's true or false? And if that's all the information that you have, then this is the best that you can do to kind of get as close as possible to the English meaning of 
not and o and implies. OK, so this is kind of a not formal. Formally, we have those table, we have the table, and now we have to define this extension. So, we, uh, so far, we just said we want to define an extension that will take truth values of variables to truth values of formulas. And for this extension, we'll use this table. So now we come to the formal definition. So the formal definition of a, the function v is a recursive. It's a recursive. A recursive definition, it goes like this. So the first step is that, so we are given v, we want to define the extension v hat. So we say that v hat, case one, if alpha is a propositional variable, then v, ga, v hat of alpha equals v of alpha. Right? And then we define for each of those connectives if alpha equals neg beta, then V alpha equals a false if V hat beta is true and true if V hat beta is false. And uh, so we define each of those cases. So if alpha equals a beta or gamma, then a v hat of alpha equals true unless both a v hat of beta equals f and v hat of gamma equals f, right? And similarly, we can define for and and for implies. So we need two more cases. Case four, alpha equals beta and gamma. And case five, alpha equals beta eros gamma. So this concludes, I mean, I, I don't write it down. It, it's all, all the information is in the table. Yes? Uh, you switched up alpha and beta. Oh, I switched. What did I switch? Like you used both alpha and beta. No. 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 Oh, wait. No. I always, the new one is always alpha. And now I look at how is alpha composed. And beta and gamma are the components that made alpha. OK? So in all of those cases, I want to tell you what is going to be v hat of alpha. And I'm checking what is the structure of alpha. So I'm saying either alpha is a propositional variable, or alpha is some negation of beta, or alpha is some beta v gamma, or it's some beta wedge gamma, or it's some beta arrow gamma. In each of these cases, I'm telling you what is going to be v hat of alpha, assuming you already know v hat of gamma and v hat of beta. OK? That's why I'm kind of introducing beta and gamma into the game. So let's first do some examples. This is very pretty simple, and I'm sure that, I mean, who, who has seen these definitions before? Oh, yeah, I guess most of you have seen it before. It's not a big surprise, right? So let, let us just do some, some calculations. So what is, for example, what is going to be assumed that I want to as, as I pick some v. So let's just take uh, two uh, variables. I'll have variables p and q. And here I'll have some assignment v1 
an assignment V2, V3, and V4. And uh, let's check all the possible assignments for these two variables. And let's try to calculate the value of some formula. So I want to calculate the value of some formula. Say I want to calculate the value of under each of those assignments. I want to calculate the value of the formula p arrows, p arrows q, v q arrows p. So I want to calculate the value of this formula under each of those assignments. So how are we going to do it? So the definition just tells us if I want to find out the truth value of this formula, this formula is the O of two other formulas, I have to find out the values of those formulas. So we can just build this parsing tree. We can write here uh, P arrows Q, V Q arrows P. And we know that this splits into two. It is made up of two formulas. What are those two formulas? This is P arrows Q. And this is Q arrows P. And this splits into P and Q and Q and P. And now we can just calculate bottom up what happens in each of them, right? So if, P, if I want to check what happens in V1, so both of them are true. So if both of them are true, then what will be the value of this one? This will be true. What will be the value of this one? True. So this is true and true. And what will be the value of the O? Will be true. So that's very easy. And uh, what will happen in V2? In V2, I have T arrows F. So what do I get here? False. I get here false. Here I get F arrows T. What do I get here? True. true. And the O of false and true? True. What do I get here? Here I get false arrows T, which is true. So this is true. Here I get true arrows false, which is false. I have true or false. I get here t. And with false, false, I have here true, true, or, and I get true. So this rule allows me to calculate backwards once I have the construction tree and figure out what is the value for, the, for alpha. Is it clear enough? I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is the, the present, the gift points that you get in your exam. <laughs> I give you some, some formulas, some assignments, and ask you what will be the truth assignment. So this should be very straightforward. But note, first of all, note that this is not according to our English usage. Because here we said that no matter what, P and Q are two statements, no matter what they are. If I tell you either statement P implies Q or statements Q implies P, it's always true. So it turns out that in this funny semantics, for every two statements, A and B, the statement either A implies B or B implies A, one of them is always true. I mean, the O is always true. Where in reality, of course, we can easily think of two statements and none of them implies the other. But that's what this semantics tells us. OK, so the, before we move on to more semantic notions, there is one question that you should be asking at this point. If you are a skeptic as I wish you are, and don't buy anything that the professors tell you, what, what should worry us at this point? Yes? It's not clear this is well defined. Yeah, it's not clear, very good. It's not clear that this is well defined. Is it really well defined? So what do I mean by is it really well defined? I tell you that if alpha is this, then go back and, 
and check the values of beta and gamma. If alpha is this, but maybe, maybe it's not a clearly defined rule. If you have, if you have in the, you look at the, I don't know where it's written, what are the rules that you need in order to finish your degree? And it, they tell you that you need to take a CS, a, I don't know what, 245, or CS 360, and a CS 241. And now, there are, I mean, OK, so this is my alpha. But the question is, is this? beta and gamma, or is it this beta or gamma? There are two different ways to take this sentence in the syllabus and try to interpret it. And each of them can give rise to a different calculation of the value of alpha. Right? You can think of a situation where one of them will be true and the other will be false. So that's exactly the well-definedness, the question that, that you picked, right? That it's important to know, how are we guaranteed that this is well-defined? So we want to avoid such ambiguities. And that, that's a very important issue. So we want to ask ourselves, why is it well defined. And for that, we need kind of a, another syntactic result. So we are defining the semantics, but it is based on our uh, clear definition of the, syntax, uh, of the syntax. OK, so here is a lemma. For every a well-formed formula alpha, exactly one and only one of the following uh, options or statements hold. So option one is alpha is an atomic uh, propositional variable. Statement two, alpha equals neg beta for some well-formed formula beta. Option three. alpha equals beta uh, v gamma for some uh, well-formed formulas beta and gamma. And option four, oh, I'll have five options, right? Yeah, I'll have five options. So option four is alpha equals beta wedge gamma for some well-found formulas beta and gamma. And option five is that alpha equals beta arrow gamma for some well-found formulas beta and gamma. So this is a complete syntactic statement. It has, doesn't mention truth and false at all. It's just about the syntax. But this is kind of the key in showing that our definition is uniquely defined. It's well defined. There's no ambiguity. Because this tells me that there is only one way to climb down the tree from alpha to go back to its uh, com com components. We will soon show why this statement suffices for the unique readability for the uniqueness of this function v hat. But first, let's prove this lemma. So how am I going to prove this lemma? I mean, now the, I mean, maybe I should hint to you. Some of the questions that I ask you, I, they are pretty easy, and I expect every one of you to 
answer. This is a question that is not easy. It is just trying to see if there's anybody who comes up with an idea and it's completely okay not to come to see. You have an idea how to do it? Yeah, that's a good, uh, always a good question, uh, good answer. <laughs> that's always a good uh, answer, but uh, I wonder if I can do it by generalized induction because I had another proof in mind. I, I'll tell you what. Okay, I, uh, okay. Let's let's you know let's follow his idea and and see where we get stuck because I think it's it's instructive. Okay, so assume we want to do it by generalized induction. Okay, so let's try and do it by generalized induction. See where we need to work a little bit more. The problem is that let's see what the problem is. So let us try to show it. Let's try to prove it by our generalized induction. And this is a very good guess because it's a statement, every statement that says something for every well-defined formula, every statement that says something for every element of an IAP something holds, this is our first approach, generalized induction. Okay? So if we try it for general induction, we have the base case. What is the induction base? What is the induction base here? Yes? Alpha is a Right. Alpha is a? No, double, that's the whole thing. But we want to do induction on the construction of. So the set of WFFs is I of A. P, and we want to do generalized induction on this structure. So what is my base case? Yes? So our core set. Our core set. So what does it mean? It includes our atomic proposition. That's all. That's all. <laughs> the only core set is the atomic positional formulas. So alpha, the induction, this alpha is a propositional variable. And now, how do I prove the statement? So the statement tells me exactly one of the following holds. Since this alpha is a propositional variable, I already know that option one holds. What do I still need to show you in order to justify the statement, to verify the statement? Yes? That doesn't hold. That it doesn't, none of the other statements hold. So clearly, clearly, statement one holds for alpha, but we still need to show that none of the others does. And why is that the case? Alpha is a propositional variable. Why can't it be that alpha is the negation of some beta? Yes? By definition, every propositional variable is a character and maybe a So why can't it be? Because the parenthesis is not a valid character. Right. So, so they're all kind of uh, complete. We are completely in the syntax. So we can say, you know, Every such formula in each of those cases has more than one character. Such a formula has at least one, two, three, four characters. Such a formula has at least one, two, three, four, five characters. So every other option has more than one character. And our alpha is a propositional variable. It's only one character. So therefore, it cannot be any of the other statements, just by counting characters. Or by saying each, as you were saying, every other one starts with a left a bracket, and a proposition variable doesn't have a bracket. So for completely syntactic reasons, we know that none of the other cases hold. OK, so we overcame the, the base case. Now let's do the induction step. So I, I think uh, your idea will work of generalized induction. Now, now I'm getting convinced that this is also a good proof. <laughs> That's not what I initially had in mind. 
OK, so now the induction step. OK, so now we have to do, deal with the case. We assume the claim holds for alpha and beta and need to show it holds for each of neg alpha, alpha and beta, alpha O, A or beta, A alpha V beta, A wedge beta. So what is the statement? The statement that is the formula is exactly one of the following, right? OK, so the point is that, so this is my new alpha. This is my new alpha. How, which of the four statements hold for this guy, if that's the case? In this case, which of the four options hold? Yes? Yeah, number two. Yeah, so here we have option two holds. What do we still need to show? None of the others. How do I know that none of the others? Why none of the others? Yes? If option one holds, then you know how the negation symbol, yet none of the other ones do. What, what do I know? Do you know that if option, sorry, if option two holds, the negation symbol will be one of the symbols. It's that are not in alpha. Right, the alpha. negation, okay. But that symbol's not in any of the other ones. Why not? Maybe it's inside here. Maybe there is a negation here. Not everything that's not a propositional variable starts with a bracket. Okay, so it's, we have to be a little bit more careful. So now we have to use some of the properties of formulas that we proved last time. So here I can say, okay, if option one, if option two holds, so this formula looks like not alpha. Why can it all not look like something like this? Because its second symbol is a, a right angle. And here the second symbol, what will be the second symbol in such a sequence? Yes? What, what could it be? Right, it could be either a propositional variable or a bracket. Because then, and we know that every prop formula is either a propositional variable or a starts with a left bracket. So in this case, the second symbol will be either a propositional variable or a left bracket. And here the second symbol was neg. Therefore, if this option holds, none of those can hold. So the, the main point is that you have to be careful. It's only syntax. We have to really argue just about the characters. Why, if I can write my formula like this, I cannot write it like this? Right? And here the argument was, consider the second symbol. Is it clear to everybody? So what will happen here? Here we will know that option Option three holds, but why none uh, of the others? This is even more delicate. Why, if I can write my formula like this, I cannot write it as a combination like this? Yes? You can consider the symbol after uh, the number of left brackets is once again once more than the number of right brackets? Right. So now we need to, very good. Now we need to use our property. You remember we had this property that the number of left brackets is always more than the right brackets whenever we are inside the formula. And they get even only when we end the formula. So we know that this place here is the first place in this formula where the number of left brackets is only one more than right brackets. Because it's the first place that after I erase the, this guy, I get equality. So it's the first place 
where the number of left brackets is just one more than right brackets, is here. So in this first place, the next symbol is V. If I also had this decomposition of my formula, then in the first place where the number of left brackets is only one more than one bracket, the next symbol will be different. So the, pro the point is that we cannot run into this situation where I have A, O, B, and C, and I don't know what is, where, how to parse it. Where is the main split? Because we know where is the main split. The main split is when we get the number of left brackets, just one more than right brackets. So it's, it is well defined. The next split, I, I look at my sequence. This is a sequence of symbols. I check when is it the first place that ignoring the first bracket I get equality, and what is the next symbol. Since this place is well defined, the next symbol is next defined. So if it's this guy, it cannot be any of the others. Yes? Um, would we have to put some sort of condition in there for, to make sure that that symbol is in propositional variable? Because propositional variables don't have uh, brackets. So the first place there will be an equal number after that first one should be where it comes from. Oh, I say, if this guy is a propositional variable, then the first place that I'll have equality, the first proper initial segment will be just p. And I'll have equality because 0 equals 0. I, I look at the first place, which is, I erase this, and I look at the first proper initial segments in which I have equality. And if this is just p, it will be here. This will be the first place because I'll have 0 left, 0 right, it'll be equality. OK? So we have to argue here. It's not that you need to remember those arguments by heart. But it, you have to kind of understand why do we need them? How do we work? OK? We need to be very formal. Although intuitively we know that this is what we want, the formalism is what I did now. And the, this formalism actually tells us we spread around enough brackets to have a unique interpretation for every formula. That's exactly what we're proving here. In our definition of uh, propositional logic, we scattered around so many brackets that now there is no ambiguity. Now every formula, there's only one way to unfold it into its components. Because there are so many brackets that we have this nice property that every proper initial segments have more left than right. And the minute you finish reading a formula, it becomes equal. OK? So now we have this unique readability. We know that every formula has a well-defined set of parents. It's not that you don't know who is my dad because, you know, I, I just don't know. Here, you, you know. Yes? You said you had another way to prove this, though? Yeah, yeah. Without yeah, but let's say, uh, I mean, I, I don't have enough time in the planning of the class to, to do another proof, but, but yeah. Um, is there a quick, set, quick sketch of yeah. it? Uh, it's, it's the same idea, but the point, the, OK, l let me answer your, uh, your question. The reason I, I was not intending to do induction is because note that we never use the induction hypothesis. The induction hypothesis was that there was only one way of reading alpha, and there was only one way of reading beta. Therefore, there will all be, be one way to read alpha or beta. But I never used in this proof the induction hypothesis. I never used the claim that there is only a unique way of reading alpha. And that's why I could have gone without the induction. If, in, if along the proof you use the induction hypothesis, then it is a heavier reliance on this type of proof. OK? So we have this kind of unique uh, traceback, unique parsing statement. And now I can actually prove what I really wanted to prove. This was just a technical lemma. And completely, notice that this was complete syntax. There was no meaning here. There was no true, there was no false. It was complete claim, claim completely within the realm of syntax. But we need it in order to prove a claim that we want about the semantics. What is the claim we want about the semantics? That this v hat is uniquely defined. 
So the claim about the semantics that we want is the, this is the claim, the uniqueness of the uh, extension v hat. And it says the following, that for every truth assignment v and every well-defined formula alpha, there is only one value for v hat of alpha that is consistent with our definition of v hat. We defined v hat recursively. We said v hat of alpha is defined by v hat of its parents. Now that we know that they are unique parents, we can show that the value is uniquely defined. You see, this is a statement about the semantics. Say our semantics is uniquely defined. What we did there is just a syntactic thing. Something about the construction tree for every formula. That going from a node to its children or the parents' formulas is uniquely defined. OK, so here we will use induction, because here we will need the induction hypothesis. So here I, I almost tempted to leave it for you. I mean, I, the problem is that I don't know you still at this point well enough to know what is just too much saying obvious things or what really needs explanation. So here the, the proof is this time really essentially by generalized induction. So let me be quick about it. So we have, whenever we do generalize induction, we have a base case a step, and we have the induction step. The base step is alpha is some propositional variable. And we defined, in this case, v hat of alpha to be v of alpha, so it is uniquely defined. So uniquely, so it is unique. And then we have the induction step, So alpha equals, say, uh, now we have all those cases. So say alpha equals beta or gamma. Now the definition of v hat told me how to calculate v alpha from v beta and v gamma, right? But in order to know that there's only one way to define v hat of alpha, now we need to use this lemma. So therefore, by the previous lemma, there is no other way to pass alpha. That was one and only one of the following options also that we had here. And now why does it tell it, why does it tell me that v hat of alpha is unique? So why, now I know that if alpha is beta or gamma, it cannot be beta and gamma for any other beta and gamma. It cannot be beta errors gamma, it must be this form. 
Why does it tell me that the truth value is unique? Now I want to look at v hat of alpha. And I know that this is defined by this table. right? It is uh, true unless both v hat of beta is f and v hat of gamma is f. Yes? Um, does our lemma tell us that um, alpha is exactly beta or gamma? Right. Or does it tell us that alpha is beta prime or gamma prime? So maybe beta. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, the lemma, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I should have added the lemma. Very good point. I mean, uh, send me an email for a bonus. It's a very good point. Right. So the, the, I kind of uh, skipped this, but it's very important. It's not only that alpha is one of those cases, but if alpha, if alpha equals beta or gamma, then for no, then whenever for every beta prime, gamma prime, if alpha equals beta prime or gamma prime, then beta equals beta prime and gamma equals gamma prime. It's not only that if it can be broken by O, it cannot be broken by end. But it's also the case that if I can break it by O, there is only one place where I can break it by O. Right? It's not that I can have it's not that I can have alpha that looks like A O B O C, and you can say either this is beta and this is gamma, or this is beta and this is gamma. There is only one way to break it, and that's very important. Now, the proof is the same proof that we saw. We count brackets. The only place to break it is the place where the brackets become even for the first time. But we also needed this component. So this is an important addition to the previous lemma that I missed. Very important. OK, so now why does it give me uniqueness of the extension v hat? So if alpha is beta or gamma, I can calculate by this rule. Why does it say that the outcome can only be one value? Why can't there be an ambiguity here? Anybody, any new voice? It's not completely new voice. Uh, OK. Yeah. By the induction hypothesis. Here I have to invoke the induction hypothesis. By the induction hypothesis, this value is uniquely defined, and this value is uniquely defined. Therefore, this whole definition is unique. So now, invoke the induction hypothesis to get uniqueness of v hat of beta and v hat of gamma. Yes? No, the, this part? That's the extension of the previous lemma. What? what? You meant the and see the comma between the beta prime and gamma prime? He thought that was a, a prime on the below. No, no, no. It is a comma. It's beta prime and gamma prime. This is not a prime. Okay. This, <laughs> yeah, this reminds me that I was, I was once, uh, when I was a TA, I was guarding, uh, you know, proctoring an exam. Uh, anyway, the students go to the washroom. Of course, you cannot prevent them from going to the washroom. And it was an exam in, in linear algebra. Do any of you already took linear algebra? So, you know, in linear algebra, you, you, you solve some equations. And in his solution, he had something like uh, 3 times x minus 2y 
to the power 248 plus 5z. And that was, I was completely, I mean, how come in linear algebra you get power 248? <laughs> <laughs> so anybody knows what the solution was? It's related to your question. The, yeah, in the, in the book, the page number when they had this exercise was 248. <laughs> and he, <laughs> yeah, he had the book in the washroom, probably, and he was copying very fast, so he copied the 248 as well. <laughs> so that was the top line of the page, right? And the 248 was just above it. So yeah, the, the comma here doesn't belong to this beta prime. It belongs to this line. OK, so we have the uniqueness. So we define semantics, and we know the definition is unique. And we used heavily what we know about the syntax in order to show the uniqueness. That was the whole point of constructing a formal language that we will have unique interpretation. So now that we worked so hard, are there any questions? Uh, th those are very delicate. Both of those claims are kind of delicate because they almost say something obvious. They kind of say, you know, if you have a formula which is alpha O beta, then it's not alpha A or beta. Sure, I just told you it's alpha O beta. How can it be alpha A or beta, right? But it, there is something to prove there. Uh, so it's very delicate, both of them, and same the uniqueness for the interpretation. So I really hope that you got, go over it, think about it if you have any and clarities, email me, send a post something to Piazza, or come to an office hour. OK? Now that we did all this hard work, we can kind of cruise a little bit on easier notions. So any questions about the, the proofs that I did so far? OK, so some, some basic semantic Notions. So maybe the first one is we say that alpha, a proposition, alpha is satisfiable if there exist some true assignment V such that V hat of alpha is true. So let me give you a formula and ask you if it's uh, satisfiable or not. So let's look at the formula P O Q O Q arrows P and not Q. Is this alpha, this is my alpha, is it satisfiable? So how do we, how are we going to check if it's satisfiable? Yes? We have to find uh, some assignments to P and Q that will make the whole thing. Right, we want to ask, are there assignments to P and Q that will make the whole thing uh, true. And we can just build this table and say, OK, let's check all possible assignments. I have P, I have Q. Assignments 1 will be true, true. Assignments 2 will be this one. The third assignment will be this. These are the only assignments. What? You're missing brackets around the negation. I'm missing brackets. <laughs> I'm missing brackets around the negation. That's an easy point, yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. But yeah, I, that's another comment I should make. I mean, from now on, I will be very loose with brackets. 
I mean, we know that we can do it correctly, and now that we can do it correctly, we will do it incorrectly. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how, how much you know about painters like Picasso, right? So he, he paints women that look like something like that, but you can see that at the beginning he first showed that he could really paint nicely whatever you want and does it out of choice and not out of <laughs> impotence. Okay, so these are all the possible uh, options for P and Q and now we can check what has happened to P or Q and we can check what has happened to not Q and we can check what has happened to P and not Q and now we can calculate for all possibilities what will happen to alpha. So in this case, this will be true, this will be false, this will be false. So what will happen to alpha? Alpha will be false. And I can just check them one by one. So anybody found the assignment that will make it true? Yes? False, false, false. Let's see. False, false, then this will be false. And this will be true. And this guy will be false. And how I have false arrows false, it'll be true. Right. So there is an assignment that makes it true. So that's the most basic notion, a satisfiable assignment. Can you give me a satisfiable formula? Can you give me an example of a formula which is not satisfiable? Yes? The, which one? Oh wait, okay. what happens with P implies not P? Is it satisfiable or not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is satisfiable if P is false, because if P is false, it implies everything. Uh, yes, yes, what do you want? Uh, P and not P. P and not P, right. So this is satisfiable, but P and not P is not satisfiable, because if this is true, then this is false, and, and the whole thing is false. If this is false, then this is true, and the whole thing is false. Okay? So this is completely trivial. I mean, this should be another kind of bonus question in the exam. But this trivial thing, amazingly, uh, involves the most important open problem in, in computer science. And if you solve it, if you know how to do it, there is a million dollar waiting for you. I mean, so here is how you're going to make a million dollar. <laughs> 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 so the problem, I mean, so the problem is, I, what I want to ask is how difficult, how difficult is it to figure out if a given a proposition formula is satisfiable. And what do I mean by how, how difficult is it? So, if the formula has lengths, say, if it has n symbols, how much computation do I need in order to decide it? Yes? If you need to try every possible combination, you need two to the end. Yeah, if, I, if I'm going to do it brute force, if I'm going to do it brute force by a table and possi all possible, fo uh, all possible co uh, assignments, so if uh, alpha uh, contains n variables, say p1 up to pn, and we wish to check by writing the full, the complete truth table, We need 
2 to the n rows in this table. Because I have here p1, p2, all the way to pn. Then I want to compute alpha. And I have to go over all options from all of them being true, then true, 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 f, all the way up to f, 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 f. And there are going to be 2 to the n many rows. Right? So if I want to calculate the full, if the only way to check whether a formula is satisfiable is to do an exhaustive search over all possible truth assignments, the time that it will take me is proportional to 2 to the number of variables, 2 to the n. And for big formulas, that becomes very, a lot of work. And there are some situations in real life where we do want to check real formulas, whether it's satisfiable or not. So the big question is, can it be done? Can it be done faster? Or in other words, is there an algorithm that you will give the algorithm any formula and it will spit out the answer whether it's satisfiable or not without taking time to, to the n. For every formula, it will take less time. So this is the big question. Do anybody knows how this question is called in computer science? Yeah, this is the p versus np question. So we will talk about it more later in the course. This is exactly the p versus np question. If you find such an algorithm, then you solve this big open question, which is considered the biggest open question in computer science, if not the biggest open question in, in science in general. So although this is, this is kind of kid's game, I mean, there's nothing here about uniqueness, unique readability, nothing. I give you a formula, satisfiable, not satisfiable, figure it out. If you can do it faster than in a table, then you make a big revolution in science. But we will, we will talk about it later in the course, just to mention, that just to feel a little respect to these stupid notions. Yeah? Just to give you a little bit of what's faster on you. So 1.99 to the power of n is faster, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have the whole weekend to figure it out. <laughs> I just read a very convincing blog on my Facebook that the guy says that when we teach mathematics, we only teach usually the students, especially in, in school, about what is known in mathematics. We give them the illusion that everything is known in mathematics. And he advocates that whatever topic you mention, also mention the things which are unknown. Because there are so many things that we don't know in mathematics. So I'm following his uh, advice. And I'm saying SAT is very simple. Here is something that we don't know. OK, so let's, let's move on to some other uh, semantic notions. So the first, so we talked about basic semantic notions. By the way, if you are, if we already mentioned it, the, the guy is called Leo Perter. And he's a professor at Berkeley, I think. And if you go to his web page, you can find this list for every topic of mathematics in school, from grade 1 to grade 12. He gives an example of a problem that is, we don't know the answer, that involves the notions that you learn in this grade in, in school. So it, it's really fun to read. Anyway, other basic semantic notions. So we talked about. Satisfiability, so the first one was alpha is satisfiable. And we have an algorithm of how to do it. We draw the table. The thing is we don't know if it can be done faster. The second important one is alpha is a tautology. And by alpha is a tautology, I mean that it means that for every this means that for every truth assignment to 
ל-variables of alpha, we have it with assignment v to the variables of alpha, v hat of alpha will be true. So alpha is a tautology if no matter how you assign the variables, it is going to be true. So we've already seen one such tautology. So examples are, so who, who can give me the, what's the simplest example of a tautology? Of a formula that no matter what you do, it will be true. Yes? Uh, a or not A. Right. So if I do alpha being A or not A, it's easy to see that no matter what assignment we give to A, it's going to be uh, true. Another one that we've already discussed is alpha being a p arrows q or q arrows p. This one is an unexpected tautology. And again, how do, how do I check that something is a tautology? If I want to kind of make sure that it's a tautology, what do I do? I just do it for the full, full truth table. But we have faster ways of checking that things are tautologies. So let me give you another example of a tautology and show you how I can check in a faster way than doing the whole table that it's a tautology. So let alpha be um, not A arrows not B arrows B arrows A. I guess that's now, one, two, three, four, three, four, four, five. Three, two. Oh, three, two. Okay, I, okay, three, two, three. So one, I need one more. Yeah. One too many. What? One too many. They went off the left. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Anyway, yes. let's, let's not. <laughs> what? Ah, the, the surplus one here. Yes. Okay. So now I'm claiming that this guy is a tautology. So how do I check it without going to the truth table? What I'm saying is whenever I have a formula that breaks by an arrow, I know that the only way an arrow will not come out uh, true is when, when will an arrow compute to false? There's only one case where an arrow compute to false. Yeah, so the only way it would, if this is false, then this must be true and this must be false. And again, if I have an error with a false, I know that the only way that this will be false is if B is true and A is false. That's the only way that this will be false, and so that's the only way that the whole thing will be false. But if A is true and, and B is false, what do I get here? A is true, so this is false. What did I do? Did I do anything wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's false, and B, and B is going to be false. No. Yeah, B is going to be false. Oh, A is going to be true, yeah. and B, and this is going to be true, and this is going to be false, and therefore the whole thing is going to be false, and I will not be in this case. So the argument was. Assume that the whole thing is false. Since it breaks by an arrow, then I know that it must be the case that the head is true and the tail is false. Then I can repeat this argument here. So I get to the conclusion that the only way the whole thing will be false is if B is true and A is false. But in this specific assignment, B is true and A is false, this becomes false, so the whole thing is true. So for formulas that just consist of just arrows, we can do a faster check. But the big question is whether we have an algorithm that does a faster check regardless of the structure of the formula. OK, so these are tautologies. Some tautologies are, are very intuitive. Some tautologies are less intuitive. Uh, some tautologies are, I, I think the, most, the one I like most is the the tautology that has really practical a tautology. Oh, not yet. Let me let me keep this joke for a, 
for an, 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 a different uh, a later step in the course. Okay. <laughs> Another other very important tautologies are the kind of the, the what we call the De Morgan laws. I'm sure that you saw them. De Morgan rules. And these are saying that uh, not for every alpha and beta uh, gamma the following are tautologies. And we have things like that the negation of a alpha and beta implies a the negation of alpha or the negation of beta, and vice versa. So this is, this is one of them. And similarly, the negation of alpha or beta in, in both directions are tautologies is the same as the negation of alpha and the negation of beta. So those are the Morgan laws. I don't need gamma. So these are also very kind of useful or commonly occurring tautologies. Right, so this could be this can be thought of as as the, the, the rule that we use when we argue by contradiction. I want to show you that uh, B implies A. I will show you that if it not A, it would have been not B. So that's what, what we do when we argue by contradiction. I want to show you that from assumptions B I can get A. Then I show you by way of contradiction that if A would not have been true, B would also be false. So by showing you this, I showed you that this. Right, so, so these are very common tautologies. I really trust, this is the point in the course that I do trust your common sense. That if I give you a formula and ask you if it's tautology or not, you think about it a little bit, use your common sense, know the answer. If you don't know the answer, you always have a safety net. What's a safety net? Write the table. And I will never ask you something with 100 variables. So we'll never need to write a table with two to the hundred many lines. OK, so I think that that will be all for, for today. Have a nice weekend, and send me emails and piazza questions about the assignment. Here.